Yes, folks, it's Tales uh, from the Jails with John G. Sutton. I'm going to talk today about uh, Leslie Grantham, otherwise known as Dirty Den, uh, uh, an inmate of uh, D-Wing on Wormwood Scrubs when I was there in 1975, 1976, that area. Anyway, do please like and subscribe. There we go. Yeah, there were various notorious inmates in the Scrubs at the time I was there. Of course, one of them was Dirty Dan himself, otherwise known as Leslie Grantham. He, now, Leslie Grantham, I'll tell you a little bit about Leslie Grantham. He had been, uh, well, there's quite a few things in common with Leslie Grantham, actually, because uh, he was a, a soldier, the same as I was a soldier. And uh, in, uh, in Germany, he'd uh, run himself into debt with various other soldiers he'd managed to borrow money from them which was always an option when you were in the army it's something i didn't do myself because if you didn't have the money i found it was best not to spend it so i didn't you know i didn't have any money so i just stayed in and read books drill books and memorized the drill book for the honest john that's one thing I did. Anyway, Leslie Grantham didn't. He went out on the piss, uh, decided he didn't have any money, so he took up thieving, uh, got himself a gun and held up a taxi driver in Osnabrück in Germany. And uh, he managed to uh, get himself into uh, an argument with the taxi driver in October, in De no, in December of 1966, where he attempted to rob the taxi driver he was armed with a gun. Uh, he said in his evidence that he didn't know the gun was loaded. He had a struggle with the taxi driver. The gun went off and the taxi driver took a bullet to the head and dropped dead. Subsequently, at his trial in Germany, uh, he pleaded that it was manslaughter because he was uh, unaware that the gun had bullets in it. Uh, they didn't believe him, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, so Leslie Grantham uh, was moved because he was a serving British soldier. He was dishonourably discharged from the British Army and transferred to the British prison system. Uh, and when I met him in 1975, he was located on D-Wing at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. Now, he was an affable character, and he'd managed to get himself involved in the Amateur Dramatic Society there. And uh, he had a part in a play that I saw him in called uh, Entertaining Mr. Sloan. That was it, yeah, by Joe Orton. And uh, that was put on by D-Wing uh, Drama Group. And it was very well received, actually. We had a audience of many dignitaries that came from the outside because they all like to associate with villains and crooks and killers and believe it or not. Yeah, so they actually did that. And Grantham was uh, quite impressive, actually. And he made a number of contacts whilst he was in the prison system because he was transferred from the Scrubs to Lay Hill Prison. But when I met him at the Scrubs, uh, he, he's, he, he was on D-Wing and he noticed my army boots, you know, and he said, uh, what's with the army boots? I said, well, I've recently been in the British Army, you know, so we talked a little bit about that. And as I say, he was an affable, amusing, witty kind of uh, kind of guy, and uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was it. I mean, I didn't have any problems with him. You know, and uh, I never did have problems really with inmates other than staff. Because, I mean, my, the way I looked at it was, uh, I'm the prison officer, they're prisoners. If if they do what I tell them, I'm <laughs> perfectly happy because I'm not going to abuse them. And any decisions made would be for the purely for the reason that we had to maintain the running of the system. So if you were told to go and get in your cell and you didn't do it, then the, the system started to fall apart. And there weren't really enough staff to actually mess about, so uh, I was fairly strict on uh, doing what, what they were told because I wouldn't give them any orders that weren't conducive to the basic good order and discipline. And Leslie Grantham seemed to respect that, and uh, I never had any problem with him. He was good mates with Gordon Goody and uh, Tony Lambriano and uh, all that crowd. And Jim Hussey was on there as well. He was one of the train robbers. 
So anyway, from uh, Wormwood Scrubs, he went to Lay Hill Open Prison, where he was encouraged by members of the prison group there. One of the notable ones being T. Dan Smith, who was uh, a corrupt builder and uh, politician who uh, encouraged Leslie Grantham to get get himself involved in acting and believe that he could uh, get work when he came out of prison, which he subsequently did. And, uh, of course, as we know, the rest is history. He went on to play numerous parts. He has a great filmography. If you have a look, he's got uh, a great number of films that he was in. He was in Doctor Who. That's, uh, and he was in a thing called A Jewel in the Crown, which I particularly liked, that one. Uh, he was in, uh, most noticeably, notably though, he was in uh, EastEnders and he played the part of Dirty Den. Uh, uh, subsequently, of course, he did create something of a scandal by uh, allowing himself to be persuaded to appear dressed up as, believe it or not, hard to believe, dressed up as Captain Hook, yeah? Uh, dressed up as Captain Hook, uh, a pantomime villain, really, and uh, online uh, in his dressing room to somebody that had contacted him, some female, uh, he subsequently was video filmed by this individual exposing himself. That, that, for those of us who are not quite aware what that is, it's whipping out the todger. And uh, he was doing that and allowed himself to be uh, exposed in, in, the, in the national press. And he was subsequently uh, retired from EastEnders. Leslie Grantham's career kind of went downhill after that. And he died at the age of 71. I believe he died from lung cancer. But uh, he was a character... A very flawed character, but uh, nonetheless he was playing a part and he did it very well at the time. So that was my interactions with Leslie Grantham, also known as Dirty Den. In the scrubs, he was, he was quiet and very conformist really. I didn't find any problem with him, unlike one or two others. Anyway, now we have that point in time. I'm just going to sing, ring the song, dear. I'm going to play you another extract from uh, the first volume of my prison books, HMP Manchester Prison Officer. This deals with my uh, arrest and trial for actual bodily harm. See, I was uh, subjected to uh, attacks by lunatics and uh, not being prone to uh, allowing myself to be murdered, I fought back and unfortunately injured, quite badly injured, my attackers. Three of them, by the way. Not one, not two, three of them. All about six foot one, six foot three, up there, you know. Quite much bigger than me at five foot eight, five foot nine. But it ain't the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. This is uh, an extract from my book, HMP Manchester Prison Officer, Chapter 19, which deals with my subsequent trial at uh, Knightsbridge Crown Court. You can imagine what my poor wife went through. She was uh, she just, just had the baby. We had a baby about six months old that was uh, born with disabilities, and we had to deal with all that. At the same time, I was being prosecuted and uh, dealt with by the Crown Courts, which is no easy matter, let me tell you that. Here we go. Knightsbridge Crown Court was a rather austere building that gave me a distinct sense of unease as I entered. Mary was with me, and she seemed quietly confident that I would succeed in proving my innocence. I was certain in my own mind that all I'd done was defend myself, but the police didn't agree. They charged me with assault occasioning actual bodily harm, contrary to Section 47 of the Offences Against the Person Act, 1861. If found guilty, I could possibly be sentenced to a period of up to five years' imprisonment. 
So this was a really serious matter indeed. I looked around the reception area and was relieved to see my barrister who took me to one side and quickly explained the proceedings. I had to present myself to court ushers and surrender my bail, then be escorted to the court where I would enter the dock. A jury would be sworn in and the trial would commence with the barrister for the prosecution opening, then calling witnesses. Mary was by my side, listening to all this. My poor wife. She gave me a wistful smile, then wished me good luck. She stood silently watching as the black-suited court usher led me away to the dock, where I was to stand trial as the accused. Having confirmed my name and formally entered a plea of not guilty, the case for the prosecution began. The first witness was the young man, L.B., who had made the complaint to the police and told the court his version of events, how, according to him, he'd just crossed the floor of the public house to have a word with me, then I'd struck him a blow that knocked him unconscious. Medical details were given about his admission to hospital and how he'd been concussed with a suspected fractured skull. Then came his cross-examination by my barrister, during which the man was asked if he had at any previous time entered into conflict with the accused. Well, I'll kick the cunt a few times, was his rather uncouth reply, which was no doubt duly noted by the jury. The next witness was the landlord of the Askew Arms, who had been present, serving behind the bar during the incident. He basically stated that, as I spoke to him about serving people underage, the young man had crossed the room approaching me with two others immediately behind him. He did not, he said, see exactly how the man was struck, but saw him fall backwards, knocking over the other two, so that they all fell to the floor, where the man remained totally unconscious. Under cross-examination, the landlord stated that as he was serving the young man, he noticed that blood was dripping from his forehead onto the bar, and that this was before the incident. The two other young men who'd been with the injured party were individually examined in the witness box. Both said that, though they did not see what struck their friend in the head, it was so powerful that it had propelled him backwards and knocked them over. My barrister then asked how their friend had sustained the wound to his head that caused him to drip blood on the bar as he was ordering beer. Their answer was, he was in a fight outside the pub before we went in. I was the first witness for the defence and explained to the court that I'd been in the Askew Arms quietly enjoying a beer with my colleague Paul after a long day working in HMP Wormwood Scrubs. I saw the three young men walk up to the bar and recognised them as being the louts who'd caused trouble in the housing complex where I live with my wife. I knew that the leader of this group was under the age of 18 years and, as he was ordering beer in a public bar, was doing so unlawfully. I called the landlord over and advised him of this fact. The next moment I heard the young man I knew as LB shout, I'm going to kill you Sutton, and saw him and his two friends quickly crossing the room, holding a glass in his hand. I knew that behind me was a solid brick wall, so there was no way out, as to my right was the bar, my left a series of tables and chairs. With no available escape route, I had a split second to decide upon how to protect myself from this six-foot-plus man who was approaching me in a menacing manner, having stated he intended to kill me. As he came close and lunged at me, there'd been an unfortunate clash of heads, and he'd fallen backwards, colliding with his two friends. The cross-examination was somewhat unnerving, as the barrister for the prosecution suggested that I was a former boxing champion and therefore an expert at self-defence. I had to agree, yes, I had been a middleweight boxing champion in the army, and I was highly trained in the art of self-defence, which would enable me to defend myself against an assault, which was exactly what I had done. Paul C. was the only other witness for the defence, and he explained that he was standing immediately behind me, with his beer on the bar top. He had seen the three young men cross the room, heard one shout a threat to kill, and the very next instant they were all in a pile on the floor. Paul said that although he was there, he could not say exactly how this had happened, as it was so quick. When asked by the barrister for the prosecution if he thought I had head-butted the young man, Paul simply said that if I had done so, then he hadn't seen it. Once Paul had given his evidence, the judge called a halt to the proceedings and ordered that the trial would recommence at 10am the next day. That night, Mary, who had been observing proceedings in the public gallery, said she was confident I would be found not guilty. 
He came across as a big thug, she said, referring to LB and his statement about kicking me. The following morning at 10am, I was standing in the dock at Knightsbridge Crown Court waiting for the proceedings to commence when I noticed two rather burly men seated in the public gallery. I had not seen them there the day before and wondered why they were in court. The dock officer was a jailer from HMP Wandsworth and he seemed an affable kind of man so I asked him if he knew who the other two guys were. They're your escort to prison, he said. It seemed that a report on the trial had been passed to the authorities and a decision had been made that it looked as if I would be found guilty and sentenced to imprisonment. So these two jailers were there to take me straight to a nominated Category D prison. Mary was there too, sitting just behind the two officers, waiting to take me away. She looked quietly composed. The barrister for the prosecution summed up by telling the jury that I was a dangerous, bad-tempered man who was an accomplished expert in both boxing and martial arts. The young man, he said, only wanted to speak to me and when he came up to me, I hit him so hard that he'd been instantly rendered unconscious, causing him actual bodily harm. My defence barrister explained that I'd done nothing more than defend myself against a much taller man and his two accomplices who'd approached me armed with beer glasses having first threatened to kill me. My barrister also pointed out that the injury complained of by LB could not, without reasonable doubt, be as a result of his encounter with me. The complainant had, according to witnesses for the prosecution, been injured in a fight outside the Askew Arms before he came in. And when he did come in, he was already bleeding from a wound to his head. The judge summed up, gave the jury their directions, and by noon of the second day, they were sent out to consider their verdict. My barrister, his assistant, Mary and I, were seated in the canteen of the court having a cup of tea while we awaited the verdict. Mary was reassuring me that all would be well, as she said one of the members of the jury had smiled at her. I felt that the case was obvious, had acted in self-defence, and had I not done so, I could quite possibly have been badly cut, had the young men managed to hit me with the glasses they were carrying. The barrister said he was confident, but a jury is a unique entity and one can never be certain till the foreman delivers the verdict. That really did cheer me up. I had barely had more than three sips of my tea when the sound system announced that the jury in my case were back in court. It had been no more than ten minutes, and this seemed to me unusually rapid. Mary took my hand as we walked back into court, but we could not speak. It was so stressful. The judge looked around the court and for a moment stared directly at me in the dock. Then he turned to the jury. Have you reached your verdict? he said. I was looking straight ahead. Whatever happened next, I had to live with this. How do you find the defendant? Guilty or not guilty? He asked, and for a moment I must admit I felt a little afraid. If guilty was the verdict, then I would likely be off to some prison cell. But I wasn't guilty, I knew that. The foreman of the jury stood up, a middle-aged man, neatly dressed... ...and neatly dressed and with a clear, deep voice, he said, Not guilty. The moment was like someone had lifted a massive weight from my shoulders. I looked across at Mary and she was smiling with relief. The judge dismissed me from the dock and I was a free man again. Believe me. That was a terrible experience. And it cost me thousands of pounds because I had to pay my own defence I wasn't entitled to legal aid anyway that's it, Tales from the Jails today my book is available, audible book I think he, he reads it very well that's the actor Alan Turton and the book is available on Amazon, thank you very much Tales from the Jails with John G. Sutton <laughs>